Chapter 2, Chemistry. That's a tough one. There will probably be about uh, two or three, maybe four, videos for this chapter as it's pretty diverse and there's a lot of information here. We possibly won't be covering all this stuff in class, so uh, hopefully you'll be checking it out here and uh, getting some of the information that you might need. We're going to focus at the beginning of this over on this side. We're going to focus over here and just look at some basic chemistry first. And we're going to start off with uh, differentiating between matter and energy. That's pretty straightforward. I think most of us remember from uh, freshman year, maybe 7th and 8th grade, matter is anything with mass and volume. And then energy is the ability to do work. Now we're going to have to expand on that energy a little bit. So remember energy occurs in uh, two types. We have potential energy and we have kinetic energy. Potential energy is energy of storage, energy of position, and kinetic is uh, motion, energy of motion. In biological systems, there are actually three different kinds of energy that we'll be discussing. There's chemical energy. So I'll write this up at the top here. Whoops, no, I won't. Chemical energy. There's chemical energy. These would be, uh, this is energy in things like uh, chemical bonds. Then there's mechanical energy. This would be like muscles pulling on bones, uh, your, your legs pumping on pedals. That's mechanical energy. There is electrical energy. And this would be like nerve impulses, uh, ions changing sides of membranes moving down. That's electrical. And then finally, there's radiant. And this is the uh, spectrum, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum in biological systems. Really what we'll be talking about is light and uh, vision being the main constituent using radiant energy. Of course, in diagnosis of disease and treatments, we use x-rays and other things like that that help out. So that's something that we might actually discuss later on. So that involves the uh, energy component here. Let me get rid of all this stuff off of here. Uh, it's going to take a little longer than I thought. I don't have an eraser, so I have to kind of back it up a little bit. Okay, now moving down to the bottom here, we've got uh, atoms and elements. The elements are obviously organized in something called the periodic table of the elements. These are pure substances made up of a single type of atom. There are about 92 naturally occurring elements. These are the ones that we really care about in biological systems. And of those 92, there's just a fraction of them that we'll really be talking about in this class. If you look at an individual element, you'll see that it's made up of the same kind of atoms. Atom, you can actually look at that word. We've already kind of talked about this word, or at least components of this word. In biology, if you see an A in the front, that means without or, or no. And then tome, we used that in the word anatomy, which meant to cut. So an atom is something that you can't cut any smaller without cutting. This is the smallest a particle can get and still retain the properties of said element. That doesn't mean they're not made up of smaller components. In fact, they are. We'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. Okay, that basically takes care of section 2.1 and 2.2. Pretty easy, very much a review. Now we're going to focus over here on 2.3. We're going to talk about how these uh, atoms interact with one another and form things called molecules and mi mixtures and such. So we're going to move from this page. This page actually isn't in your study guide. This is just something I put together here that might help explain the different kinds of chemical bonds. We're going to be talking about uh, three different kinds of bonds here. All of these bonds are going to involve electrons potentially or possibly just some charge that might be an interaction between one molecule and another or a large molecule section with another part of itself. We're going to start off with ionic bonds. And ionic bonds, if you had to come up with a one-word description, we would use something like the word transfer. Turns out that ionic bonds involve the transfer of electrons from one atom to another. More about that in just a second. As an example, as an example of this, uh, the age-old example would be sodium chloride. That is a compound. It's an ionic compound. The sodium atom and the chloride atom have transferred electrons. One has received an electron, one has lost an electron, and in doing so they've become ions. And so what we have here is an ionic bond with a sodium ion and a chloride ion joined together. So that is a uh, molecular formula that you see there, although it's not truly a molecule, it's more of a compound. Then we have covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are a sharing of electrons. There are two types of covalent bonds, nonpolar and polar. So when they're sharing, if it's an equal sharing, 
we call it a nonpolar bond. If it's an unequal sharing, we call it a polar bond. So a couple of examples of these, a nonpolar bond would be something like, and I guess up in the example up here it says that I can use a structural formulas too. So here's a structural formula. Here's a carbon atom sharing a pair of electrons with a hydrogen. Here's a carbon atom sharing another pair of electrons with another hydrogen, and so on as we go around. So that is a methane molecule. It uh, has covalent bonds, and since carbon and hydrogen share electrons equally, this would be a nonpolar substance. A uh, very important polar substance would be water, where you have the oxygen sharing a pair of electrons with hydrogen, and the oxygen sharing another pair of electrons with another hydrogen. Because of electronegativity differences, the oxygen and the hydrogen don't share electrons equally, and the electrons spend more time around the oxygen than they do the hydrogen, and you end up with small partial charges. That's a little minus sign. Here's a little plus sign over here. So that's a polar covalent bond. Still has a sharing. We're still sharing electrons. There's no transfer here, but we do have some charge differences. The final kind of bond that's important in biology is something called a hydrogen bond. And this is a weak interaction. This is where a charged area on one molecule actually interacts with a charged spot on another molecule. Water attracting, attracted to other water molecules would be an example of a hydrogen bond. Or in DNA, an adenine holding uh, onto its partner, a thymine, would be an example of hydrogen bond. We'll talk more about those later on as they become more important with properties of water. Okay, as we move on to the next page here, this then demonstrates a type of bond. From this you can see that there is an electron up here in the valence that is being weakly held, and that electron can be transferred over to another atom that is very electronegative, that is involved in extracting electrons. So we actually literally have the transfer of this electron over to this vacancy. What you end up with are ions. This would be a sodium ion. I'm putting a plus up there because it actually has more electrons. Excuse me, uh, restate that. It has more protons than it does electrons. It lost an electron, so therefore it retains a positive charge. And here is the chloride ion. And it gained an electron. There's the one that it gained, so it has an extra negative charge. So these are no longer atoms. These are actually called ions. And together they make up something called sodium chloride. So that compound is very different from the original atoms. Sodium over on this side, the uh, yellow one, the sodium is a metal and chlorine is actually a gas. So you have a metal and a gas interacting here, a toxic gas and a very reactive metal. When you combine them they become something very innocuous called sodium chloride that we've all had experience with. This would be an example of just normal table salt. So this is an ionic bond. What's holding this compound together are the opposite charges. The sodium charge is attracted to the chlorine charge, the chloride charge. So you have that uh, sodium chloride compound being held together there. Okay, the next picture is showing basically that methane that I already drew for you. So what we have going on here is we have a valence up here in carbon of four. There are four non-bonded pair of electrons. We'd like to get uh, an electron for each of these so we can have a pair here and a pair here and a pair here and a pair here. One way to accomplish this would be to transfer electrons, but uh, carbon doesn't have the electronegativity necessary to completely extract electrons. So what you end up doing is sharing pairs of electrons, as you can see here and here and here and here. So when you draw these as a structural formula, you end up representing that pair of electrons right here. You end up representing that pair of electrons with a little line. So this structural formula ends up matching that same picture. Now this is an example of a covalent bond. Carbon and hydrogen are very similar in their electronegativity, so these are nonpolar covalent bonds. And then this picture we'll talk more about later on, but what we've got going on in this picture here, these are water molecules up here, and you can see it's showing these partial charges. Around each of these hydrogens, there's a partial positive charge. Around each oxygen, there's a, a negative charge, a partial negative charge. And you can see that's listed on each of these water molecules. So the bigger atom here is the oxygen. The smaller ones here are the hydrogens. So you have H2O, H2O. 
And what you can see happening here is you can see, let me get rid of some of these, what you can see happening here is that the positive charge of a hydrogen on one water molecule is attracted to the negative charge of an oxygen on another water molecule. And these dotted lines that you see right here, these dotted lines, these represent hydrogen bonds. All right, I think that'll do it for some basic chemistry. We have a little bit more we need to talk about in this chapter, but that should get you a good start. Again, if you're having any troubles, don't hesitate to come in after school and get some help. And I will make another video that's a little more explanatory on some of the uh, organic compounds and maybe some of the properties of water with acids and bases, etc.